Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we are starting. Um, this is Stephen Smith. He is going to be presenting on the Risk Five architecture. Yeah. So sorry for a slight delay. I was going to run the presentation off my Risk Five computer, but um, wouldn't connect to the HDMI. But so far, that's three computers that don't work on the <laughs> HDMI here. The previous. The previous guy's MacBook, my laptop, and this one don't work, and it's only the one magic laptop here <laughs> that we have to copy our presentations on that work. So unfortunately, I can't. I was going to do some compiling and like uh, building some assembler programs to show that it does work and show RISC V like running Debian Linux that it's real and you can get these Raspberry Pi type computers these days running RISC V. And if you're here for the last session on IoT. I think he was mentioning the um, Espressive products, which are now all have RISC-V versions as well. So just to start, who am I? I'm Stephen Smith. I'm located up in Gibson's British Columbia. If you've ever seen The Beachcombers, that's where it was filmed many, many years ago. Um, I'm a retired programmer, though I write books on assembly language programming, but you know, back when I worked for real, it was developing accounting software, so a bit of a difference. Um, <laughs> And you can check out my books uh, on A-Press's web website or buy them from Amazon or whatever. Um, let's see, I've, my RISC V book, I don't personally have a copy yet, though it is available to sell, but you know, that's my ARM assembly language book, for instance. So what we're going to talk about here is the RISC V processor. So, I mean, most processors that you see today are either <coughs> Intel or AMD in laptops, desktops, and servers and such. And then you've got ARM processors in tablets, iPhones, um, Android phones. So um, they really dominate the market. But those are um, closed source ISAs. Um, if you want to use them, you have to license them. And certainly licensing um, Intel's instruction set, there's a nightmare and good luck to you. You'll probably end up in a lawsuit no matter what you do. And even with ARM, it used to be quite good to, uh, um, to license their technology, but now it's become much more difficult as well. Um, and the ARM is doing things like insisting that if you make a, pro, a program, or sorry, a computer using their processor, not only do you have to use their CPU, but you also have to use their GPU and various other components. So um, RISC-V has the attraction that you don't have to license it to do the ISA or anything. And if you're a hobbyist that likes playing with FPGAs and things, um, you know, you can easily create RISC-V CPUs on an FPGA. And, as, and since it's an open source instruction set, you can use it and whatever you do, you don't have to worry about someone suing you down the road if it's successful or you give it to your friends. Um, so we're gonna look at, at the RISC-V processor in, in this talk, and we'll talk, discuss a little bit about Linux and the support for RISC-V as we go through. And you know, Linux is really good about supporting lots and lots of processors, um, even ones that you'd be completely surprised at, such as you know, things that have long forgotten. <laughs> oh, well, heck, he's even active support for like IBM 370, yes, 370 mainframes. Um, we're going to talk a lot about things where I sort of say rules, like all instructions are 32 bits in length. Um, this really just to keep the exposition simpler. Um, pretty well any rule or, that I give, there's going to be exceptions, but um, talking about the exceptions would send us down rabbit holes that are just way too long for this presentation. So just, just to take notes, and I may say things, um, you know, which are fairly, you know, fairly solid, but um, there's always exceptions to everything. Um, so why, why risk? And risk processors have been evolving for a long time. Um, I guess um, the complex instruction set um, processors are things that we usually think about, you know, based off, you know, IBM mainframes and evolving down to Intel processors and AMD processors. And usually, the, the complex instruction set things means they've got quite complicated instructions that do things like um, let you add two um, things in memory together and keep them in memory. So combining a lot of memory and arithmetic, um, a lot of the instructions are different length in number of bytes it takes to specify each instruction. 
Um, the complex instruction set computers tend not to have as many registers, and they tend to have um, quite large instructions that can take quite a few clock cycles. So the sort of things that Intel coming along to try to make programmers' life easier, well, why don't we just make an instruction to do mem copy or something like that? Um, whereas the risk processes, they're fixed length instructions, um, typically 32 bits in length for each instruction. Um, memory and arithmetic instructions are separate. It's called a load store um, architecture and larger set of registers. Um, each instruction is simple and the goal is to execute its, each instruction in one clock cycle. Um, now, both camps, of course, is stealing from each other. So, um, you know, Intel now tends to be a risk processor in, internally which then runs more like an interpreter to interpret the more complicated instructions for, for compatibility. Um, whereas, you know, as, as ARM produces a new version of their processor every few years, um, they'll add instructions, so their instruction set's getting more and more complicated. Um, RISC-V is a bit nicer, in, in my opinion, in that being a newer instruction, in said architecture, it hasn't really had a chance to get as much bloat as some of the other ones, so it's still, the core of RISC-V is still nice and, nice and clean and simple. And, you know, why are those things good? Like, why not just have a complicated instruction set to um, do everything the programmer needs? Um, and the reason basically comes down to, the main one is power and heat. Like, why, do the cell phones use ARM processors rather than Intel processors? And the thing is, is the simpler the circuitry, the less heat it produces, the less power it uses. And as we've switched to a mobile world, that's become more and more important. So ARM really took over the mobile world because the battery life is better and the, the circuits are simpler and produce less heat. And modern performance gains are usually being the result of having multiple simple CPU or simple CPU cores rather than having just one big complicated one. Uh, and, you know, risk fives the new, new guy. I mean, it's not that new anymore. All these things take quite a long time to develop, but um, shares many of the concepts with ARM and MIPS and various other risk-based processors. Um, so now just to talk a bit about RISC-V, um, there's sort of different flavors of RISC-V CPUs. The idea being that it, that RISC-V as an instruction set can, can be used for things from the simplest microcontrollers. So at the base level, they have just the integer instruction set, which is basically some basic integer arithmetic um, and loading and storing to memory. So like RV32i is just the core minimal instruction set which is used in a lot of microcontrollers than, than the 64-bit version. And the nice thing about RISC-V is that the, both the 32 and 64-bit instruction sets are very similar. So when we look later in the Linux kernel, we'll, we'll see that you know, unlike ARM with his ARM32 and ARM64 in, in, in this support for the Linux kernel, that's just one for RISC-V because the two instruction sets are about the same. And then what RISC-V has done is it adds extensions. So if you want more complicated things such as multiplication and division, then you have the M extension. So most microcontrollers actually add the M extension. Um, if you're going to have multiple CPUs, you really need the atomic instruction extensions so that you can do atomic operations to do mutex and control um, concurrency between the two multiple CPU, the multiple cores. And then of course there's extensions for things like single precision floating point, double precision floating point. Um, control and status registers looks like a bit of a strange one. Um, one difference between RISC-V and ARM is that there's no flags register. So it doesn't do comparisons where you do a subtract and then later do a comparison based on the result of the subtraction. So there's no, in that just the comparison operator just compares two registers and does the branch based on the comparison in the same instruction, um, which we'll see later. But 
um, control and status register is for things like floating points, so you can see the results of what happened when the floating point operation happened. And then things like instruction, fetch, fence, and things like that. So they add all, the, all these different extensions. And there's actually like many more than fit on this slide. I didn't bother including all of them. And certainly when you go to you know, something that runs Linux, um, you know, which then has a full memory management unit and everything else, um, you know, it, it has quite a few of the extensions. But at the same time, in the RISC V world, you know, the, the basic microcontrollers, which are by far the highest volume, are all like usually the base integer instruction set along, along with, you know, multiplication and, and often atomic, because a lot of them are, are dual core. So Linux fu fully supports RISC V. Um, in, inside the Linux um, kernel, there's lots of assembly language um, routines that we'll, we'll look through a bit later in the presentation as, as time permits. Um, it supports both 32 or 64 bit, and you know, there's more and more driver support of SOCs. Um, basically, to support RISC-V in the Linux kernel, I mean, the first thing you need is RISC-V support in the GCC compiler, which has been there for a while. So you can compile and set, so you can uh, assemble um, RISC-V assembly, and you can generate RISC-V assembly from the C compiler, which is what you need for, for compiling Linux. And then the, the more difficult part, which is um, to get all the support for a, a hardware thing, is as, as people come out with their system on their chips, um, you need the support for all the devices so that all the UARTs, the USB, HDMI, Ethernet, and all those things. Um, a lot of these things are getting more standard, but it seems like as every time there's a new generation of system on a chips and a new architecture, um, there's a lot of, lot of work doing all the drivers and stuff. And certainly as you see, you know, I've had this um, RISC-V um, little computer for a while, and as the different versions of Debian Unix come out for this, you know, more stuff goes into the Linux kernel um, properly versus having to come from our, you know, archive, a GitHub of, the, of this vendor. So it's all going into the proper Linux source trees. It's just taking a bit of time to all get there, and there's usually a bit of a lag. But the real work is all the devices, you know, attached to the CPU to, that make up the computers. And, yeah, and, uh, and they've even got, you know, a lot, like I said, a lot of people in university courses and stuff like doing FPGA um, implementations of RISC-V and, you know, the various embedded versions of Linux, such as Micro Linux and Peta Linux, they all, they all have all sorts of RISC-V um, versions as well. Um, and the basic instruction set I've, is, you know, quite risky. There's only 50 or so instructions, so it really is reduced. Um, basic arithmetic addition, subtraction, shifting, and or XOR, and they're all done in, in register to register or with small immediates. Um, then there's jumps, conditional jumps. Um, there's, no, there's no flag register in the core set, and load and save from and to memory. And in a way, that's all you really need for a base instruction set. You can actually, out of this, I mean, even in the GCC library, I mean, they've got, they've got library, standard libraries for implementing everything else in just this set of instructions. So you can actually operate this way um, and still get like multiplication, division, floating point, everything else. It's just not gonna be quite as fast because it's gonna be implemented in, in these instructions. But it, but it works. And, you know, if you look back to, you know, the original, like before the IBM PC and stuff, all the things like Apple IIs and everything, um, you know, the 6502, the processor used in those, that's all it ever had. <laughs> there, there was never any extensions, and you could still get a lot of work done, including doing spreadsheets and everything else. Um, if you want to play with, with RISC-V yourself um, or RISC-V assembly language. Um, there's quite a few ways to do it. Um, certainly like this one, this is a Star 5 Vision 5.2 computer. Um, you know, it, it, they're reasonably inexpensive. Its performance is, is similar to a Raspberry Pi 3, I would say. Just the difference being is you can get lots of memory. So this one's got eight gig of RAM, so it's not, 
um, memory limited. So the Raspberry Pi 3, it's usually the thing that clogged it up was it only had one gigabyte of RAM and, and running Linux, it really got to the point where it really wasn't working all that well, especially if you did a 64-bit version. Whereas this guy's got lots of memory, but it's still a little bit slow. But this new RISC-V processor is coming out all the time. Um, and if you don't have your own hardware, there you can emulate it using QE Kimo. Um, it's a bit of a complicated emulator, but um, it can run Linux um, in emulation. I can run it on my laptop, run, run RISC-V, and just emulate the instruction set, and it, it works okay, just a little bit slow sometimes. And then there's tons of microcontrollers like the Expressive ESP32C series, um, which is similar to a Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, they have a good SDK, um, run RISC-V, and you can do all sorts of neat things with that. And as I said, you know, GNU GCC is, as well as LLVM, they all, they all support RISC-V fully, so um, all that support's good. Um, just to give you a flavor, um, this is a really simple, minimal Hello World program. Um, and if you've done assembly language program, sorry about sort of the, the PowerPoint dots on the right, don't count those, but um, this is a minimal assembly language program. So dot global underscore start, that's just providing the linker, the starting point to the program. Um, since this is just pure assembly language, it's not using the C runtime, um, the, the operating system expects you to run an underscore start when it starts. Um, and then basically it's just going to print out the string hello world. So um, it's going to put, it's going to call Linux to, to do that. So add i is just add immediate. So we can see it's adding um, x0 is the zero register. It's always zero. So it at, it's basically just saying put one into a zero as the first instruction. Um, the second one's loading the address of hello world. Um, load address is actually a pseudo instruction and that the assembler will figure out the best way to load that address um, in there in the fewest instructions possible. Um, in this case, hello world, because it's just a few instructions belong below, it can do it relative to the current program counter. So load address will translate into um, an instruction that, that calculates the hello world address relative to the program counter. Um, then add i, then it's going to put the, la the length of the string into, the, into um, the A2 register. And then the Linux system call for write is 64, which it puts in A7. And then it calls Linux by doing the system call. And basically within RISC V, there's 32 registers, X0 through X31. X0 is always the zero register. Um, and then these other ones like A0, A1, A2, A7 are just like pseudonyms for other registers. Um, and they're basically so like in the function calling at um, protocol, like we're basically setting up a function call here. So A0 is the first parameter, A1 is the second, A2 is the third. And, and they're just pseudonyms for, I think it's like X10, X11, X12. So um, just to make the code a little bit readable so you know you're setting um, function arguments versus doing something else. What, what's behind the um, underscore uh, uh, start? Like in IBM 360, it would be like a Balor R0 or 15. Yeah, so in, in Linux's case, um, when Linux runs a program, um, Linux looks to run underscore start. Okay. So if you're writing a C program, you don't see underscore start, like you write main, yeah. and then underscore start is actually in the C runtime. So when it runs your program, it runs the C runtime, who then calls main. <laughs> right, but when I see assembly, I, I assume what it's doing is it's trying to get its own idea of where it is in memory, so that it can <clears throat> set a, um, so that when it does, so. Yeah, in, in this case, it's the convention that, you know, within Linux, you know, when Linux runs the program, it's going to run it from underscore start. Right. Yeah. So unless there's underscore start yeah. there, it's not going to be able to run the program. Well, no, I understand that. Yeah. Um. From, from the assembly point of view, it's not necessary at all. <laughs> in, in that if I left underscore start out, the program would still compile and, and link. It just wouldn't run. <laughs> right. Except for when it executes that. So I know that's, yeah. so th that's the entry point. Yeah. Um, 
but most entry points, then the first thing it does is it tries to understand where it found itself in memory, where, where it was actually loaded. And I know like in, in 360, we do a, a branch and link register. I think you do jump and link register or something. That would to, to R0, which actually means it doesn't actually take the branch, but puts the return address into R15, and then from there on, they use R15 to know where it got loaded in memory. Oh, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, in this case, because we're not doing a jump <laughs> right. or anything else, we don't need to know, yeah. right? Because this is such a simple, a right. simple yeah. program. But the the other the other thing is is you know bec and because like the this thing is done by a relative instruction yeah. to the yeah. PC, so all it's got to know is it, it's like current PC plus twelve. Well, I, I understand so, that being a larger so, program. Yeah. But but it, it it may in a larger one. Now the other thing to keep in mind is is in Linux I, I forget the name of the security function, but to stop, um, you know what are those those hacks where where you know if someone overwrites a string buffer they can overwrite a, a return address on the stack. Um, yeah. Is that Linux will load it into a different memory space every single time, mm -hmm. so that it sort of gets randomized yes. <laughs> where it is, so that way it's harder to guess. <laughs> well, that's why it's important for a yeah. program to find out where, where yeah, it is. Yeah, so, so you can do all those things. Just usually it's not necessary because everything just tends to be relative to where you are. Okay. So the program counter knows because the linker you know, set you to run at start. So the program counter has got it and you can look at the program counter. But certainly, if you do a jump to someone, it will set the return address on, you know, right. in, in, a, in a register, which you can then put on the stack or not if you, as you need. Right. Yeah. And there's certainly reasons to need all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Just not in the hell of a world program. No, no. <laughs> And just if we build it and run it, um, we just compile it with AS, which is the GNU assembler on Linux, load it and run it. Um, one thing is, is the, that I find a bit annoying in RISC V assembly is, is if we're doing a simple program like that, we have to put um, minus M no relax. Um, to me, they've got the option backwards to this in that what it, what it assumes is if is that you're running from the C runtime and it set up some global registers um, so that it knows yeah. some global registers are set. So normally if the C runtime was doing this, it would set a global register into the, <coughs> the data segment and it could use that global register to oh, access yeah. it. But in this case, I didn't, it, it's a bit annoying because if you take the minus M no relax off, you have to either have started yourself from the C runtime, which you can do, or you have to copy the code from the C runtime to set up the, the global pointer to point to your data segment the correct way. Because it doesn't actually want it to point to the data segment, it wants to point halfway through the data segment so it can index in both directions. <laughs> yeah? Uh, this slide actually explains why you needed underscore start on the previous one. Uh, you, you're not specifying the, the, the entry point name, so the- No, so it's taking the default, default one. Yeah, underscore yeah. start. If you wanted something else, you could use the linker script or yeah. the command line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that just gave a sample, and then yeah, then like I said, there's 32 registers, and x0 to x31, and x0 is always the is always zero no matter what. So. Um, you can set x0, usually what you do is you use x0 as a target register when you just want to throw the result away. Um, and then if, you, you know, if something takes two parameters but you only need one like we had in the previous program, use x0 as one of them. Um, some of the others have special names, less that x1 is the return address, so in, uh, you know, if you do a branch and link return, um, that's where the return address is going to be in x1. And then the, the assembler lets you use all those names. And then, you know, then there's also, as I mentioned, like for the um, function arguments, they're, they're listed there along with all the others. So there's a symbolic name for each register, or you can just use the hard-coded register. Um, just a matter of what you're using and, and whether you, you know, how you do the function call pro, um, process. And just on the right-hand side, it's just saying who's, you know, when you 
call a function who's responsible for saving the various registers. And like all these instruction sets, whether it's ARM or Intel or anyone, there's a protocol for who, whether it's the caller or the callee who has to save the register if they're gonna, if they're gonna clobber it. Um, one of the things about the, the RISC processors, um, both ARM, MIPS, um, or RISC-V is each instruction's 32 bits. And the reason they want that is that it makes, it makes it easy for the program to decode the instruction and do pipelines. So the processor knows as it's loading instructions from memory that each one's 32 bits. And so it can load them into the pipeline much more efficiently. It doesn't have to load a byte to know how many additional bytes it has to load. So it can it, it simplifies the whole loading instruct and loading and decoding instructions a lot. Um, but you know, don't confuse the instructions being 32 bits inside that somehow that has anything to do with being a 32-bit processor because the registers are, can still be 64 bits in size. So even in a 64-bit, the instructions are 32 bits in size, and and. And that's the best, most efficient way to load instructions. And partly, you know, given that we have 32 registers, that means each register takes five bits to specify. And so if we want to specify three registers in an instruction, that's going to take 15 bits or nearly half of our instruction. Um, so just things to, to keep in mind. Um, and then that limits the number of bits for opcodes and stuff. And it certainly limits the immediate size of immediate data. So um, here's just an example of how one particular set of instructions is formatted. Um, so you see it's got seven bits for the opcode. It's got two registers that take five bits each. There's three bits for this additional function. So what this sort of would think of it as opcode is usually a general thing that it might be an ALU instruction, and then this other thing is usually limits it a bit more, like maybe addition, subtraction, or something. And then, then the immediate, you see, is only, um, I think, 11 bits in this case. So it's not a very big value, these immediates. So you can't really specify very big integers in your instructions. So certainly, if you're building, um, you know, wanted to just build a 64-bit integer out of just instructions and not memory, it uh, takes quite a few instructions. But the, the key point is, is it really packs the data in there. Um, they don't have any extra features because there's no bits to specify them. Um, you know, it really, they really get the most out of everything they can. And, and there's basically there's three, sort of three main sorts of instruction. I mean, there's the sort of like five, but the three big ones is, is, is this one, which is like two registers and a small immediate. There's also three registers, um, um, things like add, then the destination, the two things you're adding. And then the other one is one register and a bigger immediate. So those are the, the common cases. Um, and just to make assembly language programming a bit easier, um, with these um, RISC-V instructions, there's a lot of trickery. So, for instance, there's no move instruction. So if you want to move register 6 to register 5, um, they give you a pseudo instruction who'll just, assem who'll just assemble to adding um, 0 to x6. Now that may look inefficient, but the thing it, the thing is is every instruction takes one cycle, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it, it's the thing. <laughs> so so that's why they they do that. And there's a lot of lot of um, trickery using the zero register or adding zero or something like that. Um, and the same thing is is for loading immediates. You know, in this case, it's wants to load x five with one two three four. Um, what's the best way to do that, given there's a few instructions, or it might even take multiple instructions. So um, the assembler helps you in that if load immediate um, x5, 1, 2, 3, 4, might just you compile to a single instruction. But if you put a big enough number there, like a full 64 bits, it has to actually generate a whole bunch of instructions to do it. 
and it's really just saving you work, and you can always go into GDB or you can ask the assembly to give you a listing of what your actual instructions are versus the pseudo instructions. And clever use of the zero registers all over the place. So for instance, to make a number negative, there's the negative function, and basically it just subtracts your number from zero to, to compute as negative. And, and the, zero the zero register turns out to have all sorts of use to keep the instruction set down. And certainly um, all the other RISC-V um, assembly versions do this extensively, such as ARM and stuff as well. So when you're writing an assembly, you're often doing that. And this was just um, you know, the sort of instructions you get if you actually try to load just using instructions and not memory. Um, a big number <laughs> in there. It could be quite a few instructions. That's just the point there. But that's also not the way you typically do it. <laughs> so if we actually wanted to load, in this case, a bigger number into a register, um, what we use is we use this this um, this relative to the the program counter thing to do it. Uh, and an immediate. So AUPC will actually take a 20-bit immediate, and then we can load um, using an offset from a register um, with a 12-bit immediate, and combined that gives you 32 bits, so we can load a, a whole 32-bit number in two instructions. Um, so that's, that's sort of like one way that you can do it. And the assembler gives you a bit of help. These percent PC rel high and percent PC rel low is just a convention to say that I'm, I'm doing PC relative addressing and I want the high part and the low part um, since this is a common path and then it's just giving you help to do that to get the high 20 bits or the low 20 bits to combine to be able to do that. So, kind of complicated but kind of fun in the RISC V world. Um, but again, typically when we get data, we do it this way. <laughs> we actually use the load store architecture. So load store architecture just means that we have separate instructions to load or store to memory from to do computations. Um, so in here, we load the address of my numbers, and then we can just use load word. And the way the the way the um, addressing works is pretty simple. You can use indirection through a register, and you can do indirection plus a small immediate value. So there we see load, load word, which is 32 bits into x6 from indirect register x5. And then the next one, where we add 4 to that to get the next number, knowing that the 32 bits. Um, we do the addition, and then we store it. Um, back to the beginning of X5. I think it actually probably should be 8 X5 there, but anyway. Um, and that's a pretty efficient way to do it. Um, the main problem with this is that synchronization could be a problem. So if we were trying to do this to do a mutex in these two cores, um, because there's not one instruction doing the, the memory add store, um, it means the two cores are doing it. They could both load the same value, add it, and write it, and both think that they own the same mutex. So here is just sort of like the case of how they might try to get a, get a mutex. But the key point is, is because they're executing at the same time and it's over multiple instructions, they could proceed concurrently and they could get the same, the same number and the same mutex. And that's why, that's why we... Um, add the atomic RISC-V extensions is to, is to prevent that. Um, so next up from the Linux kernel, there's an example of load reserved um, store conditional instructions. And like I said, everywhere there's exceptions, and this is certainly an, an except, one exception. I like these two instructions because they're not an exception to the rule, but within the atomic instructions, they've actually got a atomic um, increment memory instruction which means that it does load memory, add it, and store memory all in one instruction, which is a, a bit of an ugly extension. 
Um, this is just taken from the Linux source code. Um, so within in that file in atomic.h, um, there's this little <coughs> bit of bit of code to do a atomic decrement if positive, and it does this particular um, sorry load reserved and store conditional. So it loads reserved. What it means is when it loads this value, is is it makes a, a note of that memory location. So in, in, their, in, the, in the Atomics extension to RISC V, there's sort of a little bit of memory in the CPU where it can remember a few of these things. So it, it, it loads T0 from A0 and it makes a note, I've reserved A0, I'm doing you know, whatever that memory address is. And then we do the addition, um, we do a comparison. And if we're gonna store it then, this story reserve, what, what it will happen is it will fail if someone else has, has written to that memory location in between. And, that, and then, then we would branch back and re, retry if that's what happened. Um, so that's the way that we would do an atomic operation. And within the Linux kernel in that particular um, file, atomic.h, there's a whole bunch of different things for doing mutexes in, in, in each architecture of how to wait to do atomic operations. So that's sort of a, a cool thing there. Um, and this is optimistic concurrency. So reading the memory isn't blocked. It's just when it writes, it, it could fail. Yeah? Oh, time. <laughs> Soon. Soon. OK. Um, I think that there's not too much more just in, in the PowerPoints, just other, other extensions. Um, there's floating point, of course, so um, we won't talk too much about floating point, just there's an uh, example. There's 32 floating point registers. <coughs> if you add it, there can be single precision, double precision. There's even an extension for quadix, quad precision floating point, though I don't know of any processes that implement that. Um, there's also an extension for half precision floating point, which tends to be part of the vector package, because <coughs> usually that's when you're doing like artificial intelligence or vector processing. Um, so you can basically add and load and store floating point numbers the same way. Um, just the difference between that and, and the integer instructions is if you're doing comparisons, you have to look at, you have to look at the flag register for floating point to see what happened. Um, there's vector operations. Um, I haven't seen someone actually implement this, so I've seen there are implementations in the works coming out. And so if you've worked with ARM's Neon um, coprocessor or the, the Intel um, SIMD instructions, that's some um, single instruction, multiple data, um, they all have different elements. Um, basically, it, let's just see. Yeah, basically the whole idea of these vector things is that at one instruction you can add a whole bunch of data. So you, you have these very large vector registers and you, you do an add of vector register two is gonna equal V0 plus V1 and what it does is it adds the lanes all in one instruction or few instructions compared to doing it in a loop. Um, so the vector instructions are the way that, that you do that. And like I said, it's similar to the Neon processor. One of the nice things in RISC-V is it actually lets you do this over multiple vectors. So when I configured this, I could actually have it do, do have lanes spanning multiple, um, multiple of those. So when you configure it, you say how wide it is. And if it's wider than one vector, then it will use additional ones according to a fixed pattern. So you can actually do fairly powerful things with the vector. So if you're doing matrix multiplications like you need for artificial intelligence and stuff, there's it, really good algorithms for doing that with these vector things all, all at once. And yeah, so thank you. And so hopefully I left a little bit of time for questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, just sorry I couldn't connect this guy to the HDMI. <laughs> yeah. yeah? Is there any particular single board um, RISC-V uh, computers that you could recommend? Um, I have the Star 5 Vision 5 II, which I've had for a while now, and I've found it to be quite good. Um, they're not as good as a Raspberry Pi, yeah. 
but they're, they're, they're getting better all the time. And I think it's Cypede uh, as their lychee pie ones. I don't own one myself, but I've, I've heard they're good too. Have you um, encountered that I think pine makes a couple of risks? Is, um, that, that could be. I mean, one thing is, is um, Star 5 makes this processor, the JH71110, and that's used in a lot of the other ones, like I think the Pine and some others. So it's the same CPU in a lot of them. Yeah. 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 Um, they seem to be generally a yeah. little more expensive than the, um, the Raspberry Pi line, even though they're not necessarily more powerful. Yeah, I think that's just one of the volume, <laughs> which is their disadvantage. But, um, you know, they're, they are getting there. And the, the thing is, these ones, like that one in the Pine, they're all under $100. Whereas you can get from um, Sci-5, which is the bigger company, they have more robust development systems, but then they're like $800 or something. So I sort of personally, being a retired person doing this as a hobby, stick to the under $100 ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are there opens, or what GPU or frame buffer video? Um, this one uses an imagination one. So I don't know <laughs> how open source or it is, but I do know there are people doing open source um, GPUs for these things. And part of it is there's a lot of people who have great ideas for how to do a GPU that, you know, in the ARM world, they're not allowed to use because they have to use Mali or whatever. <laughs> so there is open source ones on the way, but. Yeah, and I'm being told wrap it up. Wrap it up. So thank you everyone for coming on this rainy day. <laughs> thank you.